Já bych nyní přešla do anglického jazyka, abych přivítala paní profesorku Londu Schiebinger. It is my great pleasure uh, to welcome here today Professor uh, Londa Schiebinger from Stanford University. She is a historian of science um, and broad renowned expert in gendered innovations. Uh, for the past 20 something years, she has been looking into the interconnections uh, between women's representation in science, research institutions and how they function, and gender dimension in research and how these three aspects interconnect. Uh, today, she will be speaking about two aspects. Uh, she will be talking about the institutional aspect, fixing the institutions, and then how gender plays into production of knowledge. This is a topic that is very new in the Czech Republic. Not many people, apart from maybe gender scholars, think about this. So I hope that this will be uh, very stimulating uh, for all of us to think about how to, how to get gender into what we're about in our research endeavors. So, Professor Schiebinger, the floor is yours. I will help you here. Or I can uh, stand. Maybe I'll stand. Good morning. I I want to say thank you first to the translators. Thank you. <laughs> now I'm speaking. If I if I speak too quickly, I'm speaking not only English but Californian. <laughs> so you know, man, we talk differently out there. <laughs> so. Um, today, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm happy to uh, talk to you about these topics. Maybe I will sit down. Let me see. It's going to be a while since I'm doing Paul's section, too. So let me get comfortable. We Americans are very informal, and um, I would like to do it American style, that when you have a question, you just ask, even as we're going along. But I will certainly stop after the first section uh, to ask for questions. So let me get started. So Kant, Immanuel Kant was invoked today. I think we have part of the reasons are people like Immanuel Kant. What Immanuel Kant said about the very prominent Madame de Châtelet, who was a, a celebrated physicist in the 18th century, maybe better known as uh, the mistress to Voltaire, but that's to define her by her male connections. But anyway, the physicist Madame de Châtelet, Kant said that she might as well have a beard because that better indicates the depth of profundity to which she strives. So in other words, if you wanted to be a physicist, you needed to masculinize yourself. And I think these are, I really appreciated uh, Dr. Barron's questioning of the very deep issues um, because these are part of the very deep issues, the expectations we have of who a scientist will be. Um, we do have solutions, and what you need here is the political will to implement them. So I think we have a lot of work to do today. What I want to introduce you to is the Gendered Innovations Pro Project, which is a vast resource for scientists and anyone who wants to make change in this area. This uh, project was funded by the European Commission, the United States uh, National Science Foundation, and it started at Stanford University. It was a collaboration of 60 scientists, medical researchers, and engineers, and gender researchers. A unique collaboration. Not one of us could have produced this project this knowledge ourselves. And um, it was produced over the course, of, well, it's, we're not quite finished yet because now Korea has joined us. So we're now expanding into Asia. Um, but it was produced mostly between the US and Europe and Canada over the last five years. And we would have workshops 
bringing together these very diverse people, we would have roboticists who'd never thought for, you know, who make robots, who'd never thought for a second about gender. And I don't know how to program machines. So we were learning very quickly from each other. And it was a, such a fruitful and interesting uh, way to, to proceed. So today we're going to explore gendered innovations. Gendered innovations, um, as Marcella said, it is about producing knowledge. And I was only going to talk to you about producing knowledge. But since Paul can't be here, I will step back and talk about institutional change as well. So gendered innovation is about harnessing the creative power of sex and gender analysis to discover new things. We are only seeing part of the world when we don't consider all of the things that gender can show you. So we go around with blinders on scientifically. I just came uh, from the National Institutes of Health where we are, our government now, our government agency is requiring that preclinical research, this is research with cells and mice, preclinical research integrates sex into, because drugs don't work if you've been testing only on male mice. So finally, you know, finally people are beginning to see that. So gendered innovations is about creating knowledge and it is what we did, and I'll show you later, we provide researchers with the tools to integrate sex and gender analysis into the discovery phase of science and engineering. Now much of what gender studies has done in the past is to critique gender bias in knowledge. So we go around with a big stick and say, oh, you made a mistake, you made a mistake. What we do with this project is turn it around and give people the tools so that when they're designing their research, they can get it right from the very beginning. And that's what I am excited about. So let's first, let's have a little bit of fun. It's important to emphasize that over the past 30 years in my lifetime, in your lifetime, the situation for women has dramatically improved. And I'm going to show this to you in a series of draw a scientist tests. So these are school children were asked when they came into the room to draw a scientist. They weren't prompted in any other way. They were just asked to sit down and draw a scientist. And this is 1980. So this is the before picture, the bad old days, 1980. And the children, this is in the US, this is a composite of those drawings. And you see that 48% um, of the children thought that the scientists had facial hair. 25% uh, assumed that the scientists had pencils, the, the pocket protector for pencils. This is when people used pencils. We don't anymore. 63% um, had a lab coat. And here's what we're interested in. Only 8% of the students in 1980 drew women, came in, sat down, and drew women. Can you not hear? Oh, well, I like to run around a little bit. OK. So now, so that's 30 years ago. Now let's fast forward to um, 2008. I'll leave out the intervening ones. But 2008, the last time that this was repeated. And here's Harry. Harry is about to burst out of the slab. He is so excited. I take it that he's a chemist from the equipment. And this is always the Einstein hair. Again, these are from the US. Einstein is the image of science in the US. So think about all the poor men who don't have Einstein hair. Can they be scientists too? And here's the image of the woman. She's very quiet. She's just observing nature. And she is in nature. There is this weird idea that women have something to do with nature in the United States. This is why so many are in environmental science. There's a field where you have lots of women. So we still see here, even in 2008, so 30 years after the first drawing, we still see strong stereotypes between men and women in science. 
Oh, and I can't resist. I was, I, since I have more time, I'll show you these. Here is Barbie, computer engineer Barbie. She is a geekatastic doll. Now, you know Barbie was invented in the 1950s, right? And do you know what her first words were in 1992? Barbie spoke in 1992. What did Barbie say in 1992? The first words. Huh? Oh, Ken? <laughs> oh, Ken. Please. No. She said, math class is tough. Can you believe it? Why would Barbie pronounce on math class? So anyway, um, now, uh, now Barbie has had lots of careers. She's been an astronaut. She's been a nurse. She's been many things. Now she's a computer scientist. And what I think is hilarious about this is that her, her dress, what she's wearing, was um, there was a collaboration of the women from the National Academy of Engineering who helped make her outfit. Now, Stanford has lots of engineers. I've never seen one that looks even close to this. We have a lot of women engineers, and they don't look like this. And then here's Legos. Here, here's their Danish, your Danish interpretation. Lego woman scientist uh, available to you in 2013. <laughs> so anyway, I'm sure that will inspire young women to, to be scientists. What I want you to appreciate now here, come on, now we're going to be serious. Okay, that was the fun. Now we have to be serious. What I want you to appreciate is that gender is a deep social system. Uh, Dr. Barron was wondering, is it just science or is it a social system? It's a deep social system in which science participates as well. So it's a deep social system produced and reproduced by policymakers, schools, television, so if I had a second lifetime, I would go to Hollywood and try to change what's in movies, because that really does create what we see. The gender system is also created in graduate programs and in each and every research lab. It's a large social system, but it can change, and it has changed dramatically over the past 30 years. So let me uh, get a few of these terms going. I'm not going to do a lot of terms, but these have to be used precisely. Even when I was at NIH, I told them they needed to use their words precisely because when scientists write about cells and genes and anything in the body, they say they're talking about gender, and that's just wrong. We have to teach them that they're talking about sex. So sex is about biological qualities. Usually male, female can be intersex. Gender is about cultural attitudes and behaviors, and I think of it very much as on a continuum between masculine and feminine behaviors, and people change those behaviors over the course of the day. I might be more masculine when I'm leading a meeting, but I might be more feminine when I'm at home with my children. So we use different behaviors according to the context. And then man and woman, so a man is a person who is both sexed and gendered. So I will say man scientist and woman scientist. I won't say male scientist and female scientist. Male scientist sounds like he has no clothes on, right? It's a biological scientist. A man is the cultural combination of sex and gender. It's the historical person that you are. And you are your sex and gender plus the other cultural factors. You are Czech. I am American, you, you know, you are whatever, uh, you're 70 years old, so you belong to a different generation. I am 20, ha ha. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's the other factors. You have a certain religion, you have a certain political uh, set of beliefs, all those sort of things. You ha are a certain, uh, you have a certain economic level, social economics background is very important for who you are. All right, and then this image from Vera Ragetsa-Grosik uh, shows you how sex and gender interact, and I really want you to get this. So over the course of a lifetime, she's a cardiologist out of Berlin, so she's worried about disease, but I think this works for any scheme. So over the course of a lifetime, a human being or a rat or a dog or any, any uh, biological creature has 
they are influenced by their sex. That is to say, their genes, their sex hormones, all of the stuff going on in your body. But you're also influenced by your culture, the society, the nutrition, what you eat, your lifestyle, your beliefs, your uh, all of these things, and they interact all of the time, at every moment, across the course of your life until you are an adult. And now she wants to make a lot of points about disease, but we can make points about anything. The sex and gender together, plus your other cultural beliefs uh, and experiences, shape who you are. To understand the complex connections between gender institutions and knowledge, I set out three strategic approaches that governments, universities, and industry have taken to the issue of gender and science over the past several decades. The first is fix the numbers of women. That's the statistics. Uh, the second is fix the institutions. And then the third one that I have devoted my passion to is fix the knowledge. The first and most straightforward strategic approach focuses on increasing the number of women in science. And at this level, government and university programs have generally attempted to fix the women. You see, I put fix the numbers of women, but there's a lot of programs that try to fix the women. Does that say something to you? They're always trying to get us to do it better, right? You're not quite good enough, so let's fix you. So let me give you an example. Stanford University decided um, a few years ago that the women professors were paid less than the men professors. And so they decided to fix that. The women weren't paid as much because we didn't negotiate. So on a Saturday, they allowed us to take more of our time to learn how to negotiate. So the idea generally is that when Women are offered a job, they say, oh, thank you very much. I can't believe you chose me. But when men are offered a job, they say, I can't possibly work for that amount of money. And these very small differences at the beginning of your career, because your, your yearly increase is based on the base cost, these, these, there's quickly a much larger gap as you go along and get older. So Stanford wanted it's women professors to learn how to negotiate for lab space, for research, uh, resources, all these sorts of things. So um, we did. We spent the whole day on Saturday uh, learning how to negotiate. And especially the professors from the medical school. You don't want to, <laughs> our professor, our women professors from the medical school are scary. They're really strong. Um, they went back and they started to negotiate. And they hit the same brick wall women always hit when they negotiate because the administrators had not learned how to negotiate with women. They had, there are certain expectations in negotiation, and let me show you. Um, women may be, this is the data from 2007, women may be penalized more than men for initiating negotiations. If you start negotiating, you're not being feminine. You're being pushy. There are other words I could mention, which are not nice words. Um, so women, OK, if we negotiate, it has consequences. So one study found that 7% of female candidates for, see, I would say women candidates for a new job negotiated compared to 57% of men. So you see where these differences come. So there have been a lot of these schemes to fix the women. Uh, our National uh, Science Foundation ha tries to give women more funding for their research, teaching them how to negotiate for salary, setting up mentoring networks. Those don't work if the mentoring networks are all female, or on the other hand, all male, and generally teaching women how to succeed in a man's world. So it's crucial that granting and government agencies and universities support women's careers, but this is not enough the institutions themselves need to be transformed. And so now I want to go to number two, fixing the institutions. It's not that the women need to be fixed, but we need to fix the institutions. Here the goal of governments, universities, and industry is to reduce unconscious gender bias. 
Do you talk a lot about unconscious gender bias? Is this something people know about? Okay, I'm getting no's. Uh, Dr. Barron, are you familiar with unconscious gender bias? Okay, somewhat, okay, all right. Well, this is, this is, this is crucial. We have to understand unconscious gender bias. Today, people want to be fair. They want to do the right thing. No one wants to be sexist. This is not, people don't set out to do that. It's unconscious gender bias, and we simply aren't aware of how our unconscious attitudes and behaviors can impact hiring and promotion. So let me start, and this is something that has to be shown, demonstrated, because if you don't know that you're biased, and if you do it unconsciously, you don't actually think you're doing it. You think you're being fair. So this has to be shown. So let me uh, provide just one example that comes, an example of gender bias in research culture. And this was an arresting study that was published uh, in, two th I think, the end of 2012 by the US National Academy of Science. And it showed that both men and women it's not just men who are gender biased, it's both men and women, signif were significantly more likely to hire a man over a woman with the same academic record. The study sent the same dossier to 126 biologists, chemists, and physicists for evaluation. So it's the same CV, the same set of publications, the same pieces of paper. One pile of paper had the name John on it, and the other, the same papers had the name Jennifer on it. And these how they were, this is how they were scored. So uh, we find that John got a competent score of four, and Jennifer, they're looking at, they haven't met the people, they're just looking at the same paper, but because she's named Jennifer, got a score of 3.3. And John was offered, this is just a lab, uh, a lab position, John was offered a salary of $30,000 a year, and Jennifer was offered a salary of only $26,500. This really made waves because we could see that people had unconscious gender bias. They preferred a male, a man over a woman, even though those two had the same qualifications, exactly the same qualifications. Now, this uh, type of study has been done uh, for about 15 years, and we don't have improvement in the United States. We haven't gotten the message to everybody. People are still, uh, they still hold unconscious gender bias, and they really aren't aware of it. Now, the good news is that today we have a lot of, uh, we understand a lot about this. We know how to transform institutions, and what you need to do is take these various programs and implement them, more or less. So the very most, if I had one recommendation to you, if you do one action from this meeting, it would be that you take the STRIDE program from the University of Michigan and implement that in, your, in universities and in um, industry, in the academy here, when you're choosing people. Um, so. The STRIDE program, well, let me back up. The United States National Science Foundation founded the ADVANCE program in 2001. And this, so your national funding agency could do this as well. They didn't give money to individual women to improve their careers, but they gave large amounts of money, $5 million, for four or five years to transform the institution, to make the changes in the institution. So they're funding the institution to change and not the women to fix themselves. So uh, STRIDE, and I think, and there were a number of programs that came out of that, but STRIDE, I think, was one of the most important ones. So STRIDE, you know, STRIDE it stands for something, but they wanted it to be STRIDE. It's a program to overcome subtle gender bias in hiring and support, and what, it di what they did was to compose a committee of nine senior scientists and engineers at the University of Michigan, five men and four women. This room, for example, should have half men in it because you're, you're going to fail if you keep having this demographic. 
if it's women working on it. So Michigan recognizing that already. Oh, and I should say the EU always requires that you have 40% of the opposite group. So my project had 40% men on it. And if you look, you can find them, right? You can find the men who will do the gender stuff. So I suggest right away that you don't let people in the door unless you have like 50-50 of, of each. So go out and only <laughs> So recognizing that, the University of Michigan chose five senior men and four senior women. Over the summer, these natural scientists and engineers, so like physicists and chemists and mechanical engineers, studied the social science literature on unconscious gender bias. So they studied things like this study. There are lots of, lots of important ones. They then evaluated the data, only the studies that they thought were really good, did they take and put into their own presentation. Then after the summer was over, they were paid to do this. After the summer was over, they went to hiring committees, the people who were going to hire the new professors. And they explained unconscious gender bias to the hiring committees, who then explained it to their department. And um, this was very successful after um, I think nine years they did an evaluation and then they found that the number, the percent of women engineers increased, that who were hired, new hires, increased by 30% every year over nine years. Engineering is where we can't get women in the United States. So this was a huge improvement. It's, I think it's a program that works. Stanford does it now too. We, before we start hiring, before we are going to choose people for leadership positions. Whoever is going to choose those people gets information on unconscious gender bias. Because if people's biases are made conscious, they are fair. You want fair science, you have to teach people about unconscious gender bias. So I think that's really an important one. Now, there are lots of other um, programs. We have one in our medical school. Uh, which is career customization. It's very difficult to be a medical professor because not only do you have to teach, research, and do service, which is what we in humanities have to do, but you also have to do clinical work. So you've got four very taxing jobs to do. And uh, Stanford found that we were losing our assistant professors, our junior people. They were not going home to have babies. The dean thought they might be going home to have babies, but they weren't. They were going to our competitors. They were leaving Stanford. We're a really high pressure place. They were leaving Stanford and going to some place they thought might be a little bit more relaxed. Um, so uh, Hannah Valentine, who now has gone from Stanford to the NIH, she's going to take this program national. Uh, she did a career customization, and this is where you can uh, you can go on part time. Anybody, a father or a mother, can go part, work part time for a while, but then stay on tenure track and come back and have the position you would have if you went if you were full time. You can also um, you you get points for certain types of service, and you can use those points to buy house cleaning services, for example. So it's an, it's an attempt to customize careers and private life so that people can succeed. Now we also, um, I read, Marcella gave me a small book on um, academic partners, so academic couples, uh, that I, I read some of it last night. And I wanted to look at the issue of dual career academic couples. Universities were created to suit men's lifestyles because that's who professors were. They were men. They were male heads of households. And they could move around to university to university. They could move easily because they took their wife and their children, their little unit they took with them. Now. In the last 20 years, things have changed dramatically. You not only have one head of household, but you have two head of households 
in any household, right? You have both of the partners will be professionals. And um, we see, so I directed a large study of dual career couples across the United States. We surveyed 35,000 faculty at 13 top research universities. I sigh because it was so hard. Um, but we found we have data that no one else has. Um, and remember, this is from 2008, but I think the picture is probably pretty much the same today. And so this is so if you take the faculty in the US at top research universities, places like Stanford, you see that 36% of the professors have academic partners. They have, they have a partner who is also a professor. 36%, that's huge. We see that of the faculty in the United States, 36% also have professional partners, not necessarily another professor, but a doctor, a lawyer. They have a professional partner. We see that 14% of the professors in the United States are single, and 13% have stay-at-home partners. So it's very important to understand what's going on um, in, in this area. Do, so universities have had to change. Because professors come in pairs now, and they don't come one at a time, universities like Stanford University have changed their hiring policies. I was the first hired in my academic couple I have an extremely distinguished husband. He's also a member of the academy. So it's easy for the university to hire him whenever we move. But I tend to be the one who uh, goes out ahead and moves. And you can see that this kind of hiring has increased in the United States from the 1970s when there was almost none. And now uh, about 13% of professors at these universities we surveyed are coupled. That's, so it's increasing dramatically. And while we were working on this study at Stanford, Berkeley, who had a policy against hiring academic couples, turned 180 degrees, and I have them on tape saying, we hire couples to remain competitive. They understood that this is the way that you get good people. And once you get them, they stay. So in the US, we used to commute if you were an academic couple, you would commute between universities. Um, and that's, your university loses out if you have your faculty commuting because people are wasting their time moving around. You get much more if they're both in the same place. So three key reasons for universities to take a new look at couple hiring is excellence. You can get good faculty. Diversity, you get, uh, you know, you get the women as well as the men and quality of life for the couple and for the university. Now, we also have, um, we were able to, so our, the US government cannot collect statistics on same-sex couples. You, it's, I guess it's considered an invasion of privacy, but we're private, and so we could get this information. I was interested that the, the number of couples that the demographics for same-sex couples was about the same as for uh, unsame-sex couples, right? So uh, I know that Stanford has a lot of gay couples, um, and even if people aren't married, they are considered couples. Uh, it, it's comp I, I was surprised that it isn't just you know a liberal West Coast point of view, but it seems to be a U.S. point of view altogether. So that was interesting. Now, I showed you these before, and now I want to show you this broken down by gender. This, these are, this is the profile of the US professor, of, the, of US professors at these top research universities, and we see that partnering patterns differ between men and women. So both, if you look at the gray circle, both men and women have about the same, so about the same percentage have academic partners, uh, the, the red, about the same, have professional partners, but here's the big difference. You see that many, many more women professors are single, 
21% because they think they can't combine family and uh, a job, and only 10% of the men are single. And then here's the other giant difference. 20% of the men have stay-at-home partners, whom we will call wives, and um, only 5% of the women have stay-at-home partners. And interview data, so these are the numbers, interview data show that when, a, when there's a male stay-at-home partner, he may be dis... Yes? We didn't, let's see, we did ask if they had children. I don't know, I didn't correlate the children question with the single question. Okay. I'm not sure. Very good question. Yeah. We could go back and find out. <laughs> okay, so I think that's about all I have. To, oh, now, uh, now, so this report that we have, if you haven't seen it, it's online and you can... Um, download it, it's free and everything. So it has three, three sections. The first is the demographic information, the second is about values, and the third is about policy at universities. How do they make this work? So this is in the values section. And we, uh, there was one question on the survey where we asked, okay, when, you, when your little couple, when the two of you have to make a decision, who, whose career do you follow? And the men in the survey were happy to raise their hand and say, oh, me, 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 we follow my career. And the women in the survey said, oh, we discuss it, <laughs> right? And my, what I thought is, why aren't these people talking to each other? It's like, why do, why do the men think they're leading and the women think they're discussing, right? So the values are very different. Um, you can see that. Okay, so we could talk about the policies. I think I want to move on to... Um, just one more topic and then I'll move on to the um, knowledge section. So housework benefits. Uh, as part of this dual career couple study, we asked people how much housework do they do? And the information was so bad that we didn't even put it in the original study. We, did, we made it a separate publication. And it was so bad because we found that women faculty were doing twice as much housework as the male faculty. So I had to think of one of our very famous women physicists who is chairing the physics department, and I had to think she's doing twice as much housework as her husband, who's also a professor but not chairing the department. And at about the same time that we were doing this, uh, one, one of the Nobel Prize winners um, this was in 2010, I think. Uh, Carol Greider won the Nobel Prize in the United States. And she made a big point when she got the call from Sweden. You know, they say, well, what are you doing? She said, I'm doing the laundry. <laughs> and she made a big point about that. And she made a big point to be photographed with her children. Because she wanted to say that we Nobel Prize winners also are people and we do housework. And I was so glad she showed herself doing the laundry because we had this information that women professors are doing twice as much housework as men professors, and why should Nobel Prize winners be wasting their life doing housework? Shouldn't they be doing something else? So we did this study of housework benefits, and what we wanted to do, our solution, is to take it out of the household and the fighting between the husband and wife and other partners about doing the laundry or loading the dishwasher or feeding the kids. We want to take it out of that realm and put it into the institutional realm. Our solution is to ask universities to provide a benefit for housework. So, for example, at Stanford University, we don't do it yet, but we asked, and some of the companies in Silicon Valley do it, we ask that they provide money for their professors to buy housekeeping. So you can pay for housekeeping. What this does, we also worked with a group of housekeepers when we were, uh, you know, professional housekeepers when we were doing this because in the United States, and I know also in Sweden, house cleaning is very often on the black market. It's poorly paid, 
the house cleaners don't get benefits, they don't have retirement benefits, et cetera, et cetera. We want to make that a proper job with the benefits it should have and then have the professors and staff and whoever be given support to pay to have their housework done. I think you get more creativity from your staff. This is a big issue in Sweden, as I suppose many of you know. Okay, now I'm going to switch over to fix the knowledge, to our third, um, oh, well, I did first want to give you um, some resources here. The European Commission published this structural change in research. This is a really good document. If you don't have it, get it. It's a, it's a um, compilation of all the different programs. And then on our Gendered Innovations website, if you go to Institutional Transformation Solutions and Best Practices, you get a number of best practices there too. So uh, do people have any questions before I turn to fixing the knowledge? Oh, you don't want to leave now because fixing the knowledge is the main thing here. <laughs> See, they always leave. And uh, then he wants to know the foundational solutions and doesn't stay to listen. Happens all the time. You have to have your leadership here. Any, any questions or shall we go on? Yes, please. Sorry, just questioning this uh, gender, this unconscious gender bias. And you, you showed an example, Jennifer and John and identical CVs, the, the past was identical and you used it as a proof that there is a bias because the male was uh, rated higher. Yes. And uh, I'm just from a practical point of view, for instance, if you are a lab manager and you are going to hire a technician, so I think it's a different position, so you are not only looking at the past, but you are actually projecting the future. If it's a young woman, goes to a maternity leave as an example, uh, is it part of the bias or because as a lab manager you need somebody who would be, let's say, cell cultures in a continuous way if, you, if she goes to uh, maternity leave then... Uh, so in other words, what I want to say is that whether, the, whether it's a true bias or whether it's a practical outcome of that and oh. whether it was incorporated into your, into your analysis. Uh, yeah, so that's really interesting. Um, I learned recently that in China young women won't be hired until they have their one child for this very reason. Uh, so we have a professor visiting from China and she said, yeah, I had to hurry up and have that one child so I could get hired, right? Now, um, so I don't think that there should be, society should be set up so that it is not the woman who is the primary carer of the, of the child. Maternity, I learned last night from reading this book, thank you for putting that in my room, um, that you can take three years of maternity leave here. That's just, that's just not, <laughs> that's no good for professional women, right? It's just too much. I mean, really, we don't go insane when we have a baby. It's just really, if everybody is healthy, you don't need that much leave. Now, I have to say it from a U.S. point of view, we get no official maternity leave. So it's all just private deals and that sort of thing. So that's not good either. But if you're really talking about just what is the time to birth the child, it's not very long that the woman would miss. I would think six months at the most just for the birthing. Then there's the next 18 years. That is where you have two parents. And last time I knew, it did take two biological beings to create the child. And whether they're gay couples or not, they're usually two. Um, so this is where you need the daycare and you need the policies which give men and women leave so that it is not, in fact, the burden of the woman to, to do this. And therefore, you, wouldn't, you would have the same questions about a young man if he was planning to start a family and would be up all night feeding the baby and that sort of thing. So um, if we create the equality in the child rearing, the biological pushing the sucker out is not so, I don't, if everybody's well, if everybody's healthy, it's really not such a big deal. 
So to develop on that very interesting slide you showed, um, you know, identical CVs uh -huh. evaluated with a different outcome, where people who evaluated were just uh, men or women. Also. Oh no, both, both. So the very important, both. So the bias is bias? also in women. Women have huge gender bias. Show me a room of women who don't have huge gender bias. It's uh, and there are lots of senior women who don't pull the younger women up after them. And there's they're often called queen bees. They want to be the one woman who who is there and remain the center of attention, right? So it's not. Thank you for pointing that out. It's really not just just men. It's all of us. May, may I uh, another question? Yeah. You know, I I just want to be sure that if you say gender bias, whether it's a negative connotation yes, there or whether it's a statement of a fact, because again, from a point of view of a hiring manager. I can very well imagine a reverse situation that you have equal CVs, men and women, and for certain position, you know the woman is, for instance, married, has children already, so let's say middle age, and for that position you need certain continuity, and you know the woman, her background is as well, she is more likely to stay at that position as opposed to single man with an identical CV, uh, would be sort of more in danger of uh, looking for different positions soon. So you would deliberately prefer the to hire the woman because for the, in other words, you are projecting things into the future. And uh, so that's why, you know, I see a discrepancy that identical past doesn't necessarily equal identical future. And that's why, you know, the bias may be a practical out outcome for a, from a responsible manager. Even if the social, you may say, well, it's not identical CV, the, the, the men should also have family and children and so on, but men are more volatile on, on, a, on a job market than women. It is a statement of sociological fact, let's say. So a responsible manager should take that into account, and I wouldn't blame him that he's evil-spirited because he, he just demonstrated gender bias. Uh, yeah, well, um <clears throat> Yeah, I, well, I, I, I don't know about, about the <laughs> yeah, I, I guess you would make all kinds of assumptions, and um, I don't know, in the United States, I think that women are, have the kinds of careers that men have now, so they're not likely to, that you have to be mobile in order to get your salary to go up. So I think that the market forces are such in the US that men and women would be playing a similar game for that, especially your, your more top people. So I think to be, I think as a manager, to be competitive, if you want the top people, you might be choosing people who would both be leaving um, and then hopefully you would, your company or your lab would be giving the conditions so that both the men and women had equal conditions so that if a child is sick, you have emergency care so that person isn't staying home, right? So we want our institutions to provide uh, a floor which makes men and women's behaviors equal in relationship to the family. And I think that as that becomes true, men and women will act the same way in re reaction to market forces. In the US, you have to move in order to, um, oh, 20 minutes? Okay, well then, we have to move on. Very good, okay. So now to the most important part. <laughs> okay, this brings us to our third strategic approach, gendered innovations. It's the hottest, newest area and most important to the future of science, engineering, and innovation. So, um, data show that gender bias built into society and research institutions creates gender bias in science and technology. Gender bias in research, that is to say in the knowledge produced, is expensive in terms of lives and costs and limits scientific creativity, excellence, and benefits to society. For example, 10 drugs were recently withdrawn from the US market because of life-threatening health effects, and eight of those posed greater threats for women. 
Not only did these drugs cost billions of euros to develop, but when they fail, they cause death and suffering. We can't afford to get it wrong. So it's crucially important to identify gender bias in science and technology, but analysis can't stop there. We need to turn it around. We need to get it right from the beginning. We need to harness the creative power of gender analysis to discover new things. And this is the goal of the Gendered Innovations Project. We developed state-of-the-art methods of sex and gender analysis, and we provided 23 case studies or examples to illustrate how gender analysis leads to innovative science and technology. And I'm going to give you a couple of these examples. These are the few of the aha moments from our Gendered Innovations Workshop. So first, I want to talk about um, stem cell research. And let's go back to the 10 drugs th that were withdrawn from the market. There are many reasons why drugs fail and fail more often for women. One reason is that the most research is still done in males, whether in humans, animals, or cells and tissues. Now we have some data on this. This study was done in 2011 and shows the sex by one of my colleagues at Berkeley and shows the sex of animals used in basic research, so in animal labs. You can see that the blue is, are the male animals and they predominate. They're, they're mo most areas here use male animals except reproduction has a majority of females. But what I want to point your attention to is the gray area. That is where scientists do not report the sex of their subject. This is money wasted. If you don't know the sex of that subject, you can't use it in meta-analysis. It's money wasted, and you might as well throw that money out the window. The same is true for cells and tissues. This study was done at Mayo Clinic in the United States in the field of cardiology. And you see here that male cell lines are more often used, but here there is only gray area. Scientists almost never report the sex of their cell. And again, this is money wasted. You simply can't use it in the future. So stem cell research, and I think now I want to go to the website, and I want to talk about stem cell research. So here is our website then. You have the methods here. You have all the terms that I was talking about. And then you have our 23 examples of how using sex and gender analysis can give you something new. And um, I'm going to go to the stem cell example. And look at this. Stem cell research is a highly valued area of research and holds promise for threatening diseases such as Parkinson's disease or muscular dystrophy. Stem cell research focuses on inducing pluripotent potency in cells derived from adults and using these cells to repair or reconstruct organs. Yet in most laboratories, the sex of the cell is not taken into account which can lead to life-threatening consequences and leave researchers with unsolved problems. So take, for example, the problem that an international collaboration between Norway and Australia ran into. Researchers in the lab were taking bone marrow stem cells and putting those in mice. They, they used both male and female mice, so already that's a good research design. But quite unconsciously, again, this is unconscious bias, they used all female stem cells. And when they injected them into their, their mice, they found that the males were dying systematically. And they didn't know why, because they hadn't considered the sex of the cell. They didn't know why. They put the, they put the project to the side. They thought maybe a postdoc made a mistake. You know, when in doubt, blame the postdoc. And they didn't know how to go on. But we, we happened to um, 
do a gendered innovations workshop in Norway, and they realized, aha, we should look at the sex also of our cell. We were using male and female animals, and we need to consider the sex of the cell. Now, if you look at stem cells, you, these are from, derived from muscle. You can see that the XX stem cell is more active than the XY stem cell. We can see that there might be differences in how uh, effective these are when you implant them. So um, what the point we, so then um, we don't know yet how the research in Norway will go on, will come out, but they have now an idea of how to go on. When you look at stem cells, you need to consider um, the donor. This is the stem cell. You need to consider this, all the logical possibilities that you have. This is the sex of the stem cell of the donor. This is the sex of the recipient, or in this case, the mouse. And uh, you might find that male to female is your most effective combination, male to male, female to female, uh, female to male, but you have to do the experiment before you can assume that one cell will be more effective for the therapy you're trying to develop than the other. And then, of course, it's never that easy. Not only do you have to consider sex and the combination of sex in this work, but you have to look at, well, what is the cell type? Maybe that has a bearing on it. You have to look at these factors that intersect with sex and gender. Um, the disease being treated, and other variables, the hormonal uh, context, and the environment, and so on. So analyzing sex will be one important aspect um, as we move forward. So that's one example. If we want to use stem cell therapies, we have to be very careful about how we do that. Now my next example I want to give you um, is from engineering. And I'm going to take an example from machine translation. And I have to say that I'm going to pick on Google a little bit in this example. I think Google is a great company, um, but we found some problems. So I start with a little story. A couple of years ago, I was in Madrid, and I was interviewed for some Spanish newspapers. Sadly, I don't read Spanish, so when I returned home, I put the articles through Google Translate. And I was shocked in 2013 that I was referred to as he. Londa Schiebinger, he wrote, he thought, and occasionally it, uh, it, it wrote, whatever. Um, Google Translate has a male default. So I thought, okay, I'll look at Sistran, which is the big European um, system. And it also has the same problem, a male default. So Londa Schiebinger, he, his, to him. I became, oh, it, it says. So I became, suddenly I became a male. Now, my question was, how could such a cool company as Google make such a fundamental error? Google Translate defaults to the masculine pronoun because he said is more commonly found on the web than she said. And we know this from another Google product. Now, what's really interesting about this is that we have had a cultural revolution in how language is used. You can see this is Ngram. It's a really great program to use if you want to look at change in language. You can see that in English, we have changed from he said to she said, it peaked in 1968 at 4 to 1, he said to she said, and then dropped to 2 to 1, he said to she said, in the 2000s. A huge improvement, a cultural revolution. Everybody in the United States uses inclusive language. President Obama says he says and she says. All the newscasters, all the professors, everybody uses inclusive language, but not Google Translate. With one algorithm, they wiped out 40 years of change. And what brought about this change? A lot of governmental funding to create equality, the women's movement, for example. And with one algorithm, Google wipes all of this out, and they didn't mean to. So we went to Google, and we said, mm, you have a small problem. And they were, they were horrified. They were just, it was just terrible. So we invited them to one of our workshops, and they listened for about 20 minutes. They got it, and they said, oh, we can fix that. 
So I know that they're working to fix it. I've seen the papers coming out. It turns out once you've designed something, it's kind of hard to retrofit it to the opposite sex. So I'm recommending that people design it correctly from the beginning because it's easier to do that than to get a bug in there that you have to fix. Now, as a Stanford professor, I wondered how, you know, Google is 20 minutes down the street from Stanford, and a lot of the Stanford graduates go to Google. And as a Stanford professor, I wondered, how did they get out of Stanford without knowing the very basics to ask this question? Does my program have a male default? Am I doing something? You know, you could ask the same thing about Apple, who launched a Siri, the voice. Do you use the iPhones to have Siri voice? Apple got into a lot of trouble for launching this female assistant. She was supposed to be witty and a little bit sexy. Well, what do I want a witty female sexy assistant for? And so if they had, if they had thought for a minute about the female customers, they would have launched several voices so you could choose in the first place. So Apple quickly then launched other voices, so now you can choose. But why would you make such a blunder? Why bother making such a big mistake and alienating customers? So I think in engineering we have um, a large opportunity to make changes where engineers simply think about all of the people that they will be serving. Now I want to um, take an example that has to do also with men, and that is osteoporosis research. A lot of our examples um, have to do with women because they're the ones who have been left out of research. But osteoporosis, you know what osteoporosis is, right? The thinning of the bone in older people so that when you fall you might fracture a hip. Well, osteoporosis has always been conceptualized as a female disease because it hits women harder and younger. And what it turns out then that men have not even been part of the research for osteoporosis. So this is one example where we have developed diagnostics and treatments and we have completely left men out. But after the age of about 75, a third of the osteoporotic fractures will be in men. And when men break their hips, they tend to die more often than women. So it's a very serious situation. The gendered innovation in this case was uh, first reconceptualizing osteoporosis as a male disease, and then rethinking standards and reference models. That's the method that we used. I told you that we have 12 methods um, in this project. Um, and when you're being checked for osteoporosis, you're put through a machine. And the machine, until men were included, was based on young white women, healthy white women, and that's how the disease was diagnosed. So if a man had gone through this machine, the machine would have been blind, completely blind to his disease because it was calibrated to see women's disease. So the big uh, gendered innovations that came here came in about 1997 when a reference population for men was also developed, um, and so now you can calibrate the machine to the person that you are trying to treat. Then there were, I don't want to take too much time to look at this because I want to look at policy, but there were some other big surprises, and that was that you have to also look at the other social factors that produce bones, such as exercise, cultural uh, norms, such as the kinds of food you eat, um, there was a very interesting result where they found that um, you can't just make one reference population for white men, for example. We know that in the United States, African-American men and white men often have very different bone type. But then we take category white men to be all the same. But there was a cross-cultural study of U.S. men and Danish men and they found that because of the difference in levels of exercise um, and diet, that there were quite a few differences between what we think of as category white men. Okay, now I want to go on and finish up with just some policy recommendations. 
and you will find this to be an important part of our website as well. So what can be done? I'm very sad that your person who wanted to know what can be done is no longer with us. So policy is very important um, for driving excellence in science. <clears throat> and we need, there, there are several things that we need to know. So I need, how many of you are part of a granting agency? You either read grants and vet grants or you set policy at granting agencies. Okay, important job back there. So granting agencies, and even if you aren't part of the agency, you can push for this kind of change. Granting agencies can ask applicants to explain how sex and gender analysis is relevant to their proposed research. As you know, the, and then here we have all of the policies of major granting agencies loaded up. And as you know, the European Commission has asked since December, they put this policy through in December, um, you have to include sex and gender analysis if you're applying for EU money or you don't get the money. So if you have, they've now designated 137 subfields of science, health, um, research, and you must include in your design, you will use many, many methods, but if your field requires also sex or gender analysis, you must include that to get your score. So that's very important. Um, as I said, the United States uh, NIH is just beginning to do that. The Gates Foundation asks for these things. The Irish Research Council has some of the best policies you'd ever want to see, um, and so on. So if the Czech Republic puts through a good policy, we will load it on our page. But until then, you will have a big fat no over there. So how many of you are on hiring uh, commissions in university, hiring and promotion in university? Or maybe you have different, yes. Okay, so this is another place. Committees can evaluate researchers and educators on their knowledge in implementing gendered innovations. It's really important now that your researchers know something about sex and gender analysis in their science because if you want them to be successful in applying for EU money, they need to know how to do this kind of research. So it's one criteria you can have among many. How many of you sit on the editorial boards of peer-reviewed journals? Bingo, there we go, now we got some more. So editors can require sophisticated sex and gender analysis when selecting papers for publication. Watch Science Magazine the first week of November. They are going to come out with new guidelines. Um, so you will have to use the word sex and gender correctly. You will have to have um, done a sex or gender analysis. I think they'll probably only ask for sex if it's important. Now again, on our website, we have loaded up policies of journals, journals that have good policies. The best policy that I know of at the moment is from cl Clinical Orthopedic and Related Research, that journal. Read this editorial from 2014. If you run a journal and want to implement these guidelines, do not reinvent the wheel. Go and find the good policies. This one is really excellent. They, they say what they expect the authors to do in order to get a paper published in their journal. And finally, how many of you teach at university or elsewhere? Okay, so professors from elementary school to high school to graduate school can integrate the knowledge we have about sex and gender into the curriculum. So for basic biology, you want to have all the current information about sex and gender, sex differences, in medical school, you want to have all of the current knowledge about differences in disease for men and women. It will be criminal not to have that knowledge in the curriculum because people will die. If doctors are treating men with treatments that were developed for women, it might not be effective. People will die. 
So we must, and then for engineering, for all of these other things, we will save a lot of problems and we will create better societies if we are designing for everyone. It's crucial to train the next generation. So in closing, innovation is what makes the world tick. And as I hope I've begun to show, gendered innovation spark creativity by offering new perspectives, posing new questions, and opening new areas for research. We can't afford to ignore such opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Máme teď pár uh, minut, už pouze jenom pár minut na diskusi, a tak pokud by byly otázky a chtěla bych poprosit, a pokud bude mít někdo otázku ve vedlejší místnosti 205, tak prosím přijďte sem za námi, abyste se zeptali tady. Tak, Uh, Londa, I'm a geologist, uh, so I don't uh, really know how Kaya can I implement the uh, gender issues in our studies. I'm sure that if you start to look at it closely, you can uh, advise me something. One comment, uh, in the panel in Czech Science Foundation in for geology and geophysics, there is not a single woman. So um, this is also a question of uh, the <laughs> cultural habits or whatever. Uh, I would like to ask you about this uh, uh, couple hiring, uh, if you could comment on it shortly, because if this could be fixed at universities, that you can open two positions at the same time in completely different specializations, then maybe everything can be fixed. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, if you look at our report, the third section looks at the policy. And in the United States, Public universities and private universities do it a bit differently. Public universities um, have money in the chancellor's office so that when one professor is hired, they can go to another department and they can ask that a position be created. And then there's a, a one third, one third, one third solution. The department that hired the first partner will pay a third of the salary for a while. The department of the second partner will pay a third of the salary and a third of the money will come from the chancellor's office. So um, we also understand in the United States that if my department, say I'm geology, and my department hires a first partner and we want to place a second partner, let's say in the English department, um, we know that the next year it might Oh, and say we're in the English department, and it's like, okay, well, we didn't want that specialty. It's medieval English. We don't want that. But we know that in the next year, we might have a first hire, and we want somebody else to take our hire. So we have to think of solving it as a whole university, being a li little bit more flexible and um, you know, changing the way we do it. It's no longer just one person who's hired at a time. It ch things you know, times have changed. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Professor, for sharing very interesting presentation. My name is Monika Gmutsova. I'm CEO of Global Institute for Extraordinary Women. So uh, when we look beyond the numbers and gender, uh, my question is uh, when we look what are actually women bringing uh, these days, why is the role critical? It's the, their carriers of the feminine qualities, such as collaboration, intuition, uh, long-term vision, care, and these are critical to create sustainable and resilient society. Now, when current model, also in science, doesn't work, and rather than fixing, my question is, what is the vision and what is possible? What kind of environment we want to create in, in the science? And what are women missing? What support they need? to be really authentic, fully expressed, and bring these qualities that, that just create uh, new possibilities in science. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we run, so when you say something like women are more cooperative and more nurturing and those sorts of things, we run into the difference dilemma. So I don't think that all women are cooperative and nurturing. I do agree that historically, professions, including science, have pushed those qualities away. And I argue that very strongly in my first book from 1989. 
But I don't think that we can, we need to be a little bit careful with these stereotypes that women are some way and men are some way because then we put men and women into boxes. So what I want to do is have people analyze. I want people to use gender analysis that everybody learns in school so that they can analyze what are the values of their group and are we using competition as our base value? Would we like to broaden those values? We can't really expect women to come in and as a minority change everything. That's not fair to the newcomers. Um, so I, I'm a little bit, we, we could discuss this more. I'm a little bit worried about that argument that women carry these different values. On the other hand, you see that women do carry different values. They choose different topics. Um, women don't like theoretical physics, for instance, and they love environmental studies. So we do see that men and women make choices to do different things. So as I said, it's a real dilemma. And I think we need to discuss this before we make uh, huge decisions about uh, these stereotypes. I will say that there have been some interesting articles. There's one by Woolley that was published in Science Magazine, and she showed that the group intelligence increases as you bring in diverse people. So you get a greater group IQ because you have incorporated people with different values, and I find that very interesting. Okay, I'm very sorry, but I will have to stop us now here uh, because we need to get coffee break and refresh ourselves a little bit before the next panel. So once again, thank you so much mm -hmm. for coming here and sharing uh, your work with us. Mm -hmm. Very glad. <laughs>